seats and join me in welcoming our two announcers for the evening, Ryan Tierney and Abia Khan, representing Harvard ROTC program. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to today's John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum at the Institute of Politics. Tonight, we will be reflecting on the war in Afghanistan, its impact on the lives of service members, and the indelible influence it has had on our nation. My name is Ryan Tierney. I'm a sophomore studying history and literature, living in Leverett House, and I'm also a midshipman in Harvard's Old Ironsides Naval ROTC Battalion. My name is Abia Khan. I'm a sophomore studying government, math, and education living in Dunster House. I'm also a cadet in the Paul Revere Army ROTC Battalion. Like many young Americans, we have always known war in Afghanistan. There's never been a time in our lives where our country hasn't been at war. When we were born in the wake of 9-11, the worst terrorist attack to ever take place on US soil, my dad was teaching me to ride a bike Thousands of U.S. troops were flying to Afghanistan for the surge in 2009. When I was sitting in classrooms, going to swim practices, and learning to be a man, a fellow American was standing watch across the world. Through the lens of the news camera or the pen of the reporter, we learned about the war in Afghanistan. And as we grew up, the war grew with us. Now, we have come of age. And we are honored to be joined by a group of service members from our Harvard community to whom we can look for new perspectives. Mr. Thomas Bishop, an MPA candidate at the Harvard Kennedy School and graduate of the University of Arkansas, is a US Army Reserve officer with nearly 20 years of enlisted and commissioned military service. Ms. Shalane Etchison, an MPA and MBA candidate at HKS and a graduate of the University of Central Florida, served 11 years in the US Army where she conducted security, intelligence, and combat functions in special operations and military police units. Mr. Soren Dugan, an MPA candidate at HKS and a graduate of Columbia University, served for nine years in the United States Army, where he operated in multifaceted intelligence collection roles for US special operations. Mr. Joseph Stenger III is an MPA and MBA candidate at HKS who, after earning his commission through Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University's Air Force ROTC program, flew 77 combat missions in support of Operation Enduring Freedom, and collaborated with over 100 Afghan women to form nonprofits that empowered girls in education and employment. Mr. Edward Figueroa, a Belfer National Security Fellow and a graduate of Fordham University, is a United States Army Foreign Off Area Officer who specialized in Western Hemisphere political military affairs. We are also honored to be joined by our moderator, Mr. Seti Warren, the Executive Director of the Institute of Politics at the Harvard Kennedy School. Prior to this role, he served as the Executive Director of the Shorenstein Center on Media, Politics, and Public Policy, the Mayor of Newton, Massachusetts, and an Iraq War veteran, Mr. Mr. Warren served as an Intelligence Specialist in the U.S. Naval Reserves. Thank you all very much for joining us tonight, and we hope you enjoyed the discussion. Everyone, it's great to be with you. Welcome to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum for this incredibly important conversation. I want to just do one thing before we begin. I'd like you to give a round of applause to these extraordinary uh, members of the armed forces and and all the work they've done. Please give them a round of applause. So as I reflected upon this conversation this evening, I, I thought about the time when I returned home from my service in Iraq in 2008. I did a year-long deployment. And I'll never forget civilians, brothers and sisters, family members saying thank you for your service. While I appreciated that very, very much, I wondered if there was some way I could share with them 
what it was really like on the ground in a combat zone. If I could share with them the experiences, the relationships, what I saw, if I could share them with everyday people, civilians, voters, public policymakers, elected officials, perhaps those decision makers in all walks of our society would make sounder decisions when it comes to sending troops into harm's way. And that's what this conversation is about this evening. It's about having real life service members who did extraordinary things overseas, not just in, in Afghanistan, but in other parts of the world, share their life perspective, their views, their, their experiences with you all, future public policymakers, leaders, voters, people who will make decisions about who makes decisions in regard to the military, our defense, and foreign policy, hearing from those who served on the ground. So with that, we're gonna get into a conversation um, first, and then after we do, we're gonna open up the floor for questions from you all, but we're gonna dive right into uh, to, to this conversation. So Eddie, I wanna uh, just start with you. You've had an incredible journey in the military. I really would love to focus on Afghanistan, and I'd, I'd love for you to share your experiences and what you think people need to know about those experiences, what you saw in Afghanistan. Thank you. Everybody hear me all right? Okay. Yeah, I just want to kind of set the, set the, sound like a robot, right? <laughs> kind of want to set the stage. Um, September 11th, 2001, I was in New York City uh, as a student um, doing my undergrad when, uh, when that day happened. Um, just like everybody, uh, the initial uh, notice that a plane had hit uh, one of the world towers, everybody thought it was one of these Cessna airplanes uh, taking tourists around the city. When the second airplane hit, um, I knew that the world had changed. And I think, uh, like most of us, made a deci decision to uh, join the military and serve my country. Can you hear me now? Thank you. Yep. So September 11th really changed my life. Um, it was like every New Yorker, it was personal. Um, and like many Americans, um, decided that I wanted to serve. A few years later, uh, first deployment to Iraq, then a few years later, Afghanistan. I had the honor to command and be an operations officer in, in Afghanistan in 2010 to 2011 during the surge in Kandahar City. Um, our mission was, or my mission was, I had a Charlie Med company, it's a medical company, it's a, a field hospital, and my responsibility as the commander was to set up level two care for our brigade, which is probably 4,000 plus uh, service members to include our Afghan partners in a vast area in, the, in Kandahar. That responsibility was to get that service member or that person injury, injured from point of injury to our level two care and then in an upper echelon more to level three care and, 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 and get them to safety. It was critical because the, uh, the terrain, um, the injuries that we saw were really due to improvised explosive devices. So a lot of the injuries that we saw, we saw multiple amputations. And uh, these great Americans uh, were saving our battle buddy's life, which was in modern medicine was extraordinary. Um, we called it the, fifth, the platinum uh, 15 minutes. 
Um, everybody talks about that golden hour. We have to get that person from point and injury uh, to get them stabilized. But to get a service member that has multiple triple amputees and save their lives is something extraordinary. Um, very challenging year. Um, we averaged, um, there was uh, one company that averaged about a platoon of service members, which is about 65 uh, service members that were either an amputee or double or triple amputee. Um, and if you study the history in Afghanistan, the Argandab River Valley was somewhere where every major occupying force was beat up by, by the Afghans. The Russians were beat up there, even Alexander the Great. So coming into this area for the first time as Americans uh, was something that we all had in mind. Um, we'll continue to, to talk about some of our, our experiences, but I want to give uh, the floor to my, to my battle buddies. But that, is, uh, that was our primary mission while we were in Afghanistan. All right. Thanks, Eddie. Um, you know, I, many of my views are going to be expressed by Eddie and by Shalane and the rest of the panel. So I want to use my time to talk about the current efforts that veterans have in evacuating uh, our allies that are stuck in Afghanistan to this day. Um, when it became evident that Afghanistan was going to fall, a few things had happened. The first is panicked Afghans who had spent the last 20 years supporting the U.S. forces there through interpreters or in a variety of capacities, scrambled, went into hiding and scrambled to reach out to the U.S. veterans that they knew because they knew that they would be systematically hunted and killed by the Taliban. Those veterans, the second thing that happened, happened to be junior officers and non-commissioned officers like the people you see on the stage. Um, because we were the ones that interacted with them the most when we were in <laughs> Afghanistan. They reached out to us, and within a few hours, literally, of getting these barrage of phone calls, tens of thousands of phone calls and text messages, the year veterans organized. We didn't know each other. We had never worked with one another before, but we were organized in order to form these evacuation efforts uh, in Afghanistan. And this became known as Digital Dunkirk. Now, the thing that I want you guys, there's three, maybe four, depending on the time I have left, but three things primarily that I want you to know about uh, Digital Dunkirk. The first is, is that no matter what you think you know about how the evacuation went, no matter how much you watch the news or plugged into online, I promise you it was exponentially worse than you could possibly imagine. The chaos, the violence, the carnage, it was bad, and it is bad. You know, we, we organized ourselves into these groups on Signal, and I'm not going to share the names for security, but one group would actually, a great name for it would be Screams for Help. And there are two stories that came across there that I will never forget as long as I live. The first is one former interpreter who was a, uh, received a special immigration visa to the United States. His pregnant wife was beaten so badly at a Taliban checkpoint that she went into labor in the streets of Kabul. And then the second, and really heartbreaking was uh, a message that read, please help, I have an infant with a traumatic brain injury stuck at Northgate, he's dying, can someone please put us in touch with the medics inside of Kabul airport um, to get medical help? And the truth is, I have no idea how those stories ended because for days, up until today, it's just text after text after text screaming for help from veterans that are doing this on our, our volunteer time, and some of us when we're sitting in class here. Um, the reason it was so bad is because the civ process is broken. You know, we, we created a system for these people to come into the United States years ago, and for whatever reason, the average time it takes for them to work through the system is four years, and I think that's conservative. So it's a broken process, and it's gotta be fixed. Um, the second thing that I want you all to know is that this is ongoing. This is happening today. Um, I personally am trying to evacuate about 30 Afghans. Just before I walked into this room, I, I got to ask for help for safe houses in Kabul. 
And I'm not alone. I imagine the people on this stage and in the classroom uh, that you might be in class with are getting these text messages and responding in the middle of their finance class, hey, here's where I know a safe house is and let me hook you up with that. Uh, it is ongoing and it will be ongoing for quite some time. Um, and we could certainly use your support. So if there's any, if any of you wanna pitch into the effort, please find me after. Um, thirdly and lastly is that we are doing this, veterans and NGOs and we're doing this on our own time, on our own dime. And we're doing it because we feel a sense of obligation to the people of Afghanistan who have given us in the United States so much. Yes, it didn't turn out the way that any of us wanted to. It's heartbreaking to know that the women that we had put into school are now burning their diplomas because the Taliban don't want to, because they risk being um, attacked by the Taliban for their education. But we need to put, we need to fix what, was, what we had broken, or at least make some effort to fix what we had broken, and we're doing that now through the evacuation effort. And so I think uh, I am out of time. I'm gonna appreciate it very much, and I'm gonna hand it over to uh, Shalane. Use this mic, can everyone hear me? Got it. Um, yeah, I think Joe's point segues into something that I continue to come back to with my experience with Afghanistan and what I'm grappling with today, and I know a lot of other veterans, is reconciling with moral injury. And especially the events that have happened and transpired over the last month has made that moral injury worse. It has reopened wounds that we have tried to close since our time there. So a little bit of context on who I am and my story and how Afghanistan fits into my life. Uh, September 11th happened when I was a sophomore in high school, 15 years old. I do not come from a military family at all, but I, uh, I could not shake the notion that I wanted to be part of this effort. I read the books, I watched the news, I joined ROTC, and kind of on a leap of faith, I joined the Army. And I really took it seriously. I was gonna commit to this thing, and um, in college, I ended up graduating my program, number one. I joined the Army specifically because I wanted to be on the ground. I wanted to witness and partake in this effort firsthand. Now, in 2008, when I graduated, RT, uh, commissioned, and graduated undergrad, um, that was when the Department of Defense still very much had this women in combat ban policy. So because I was a woman, I was barred from about a third of the jobs available in the Army at the time, purely based on being a woman, um, because these jobs, their whole, their whole essence was um, engaging in direct combat, which I was not allowed from, not allowed to participate in. So um, the best I could do was go military police. At the time, military police units were being deployed quite frequently to Iraq. They were doing, think like convoy security missions or training the Iraqi police. So my first deployment was to Iraq, to Ramadi, um, my first three years in the Army to include this deployment were not good. I quickly became the alarm, part of the alarmingly high statistics of women um, being subjected to sexual harassment, assault. My commander very much had bias against me, um, and I was treated second class compared to my lieutenant peers. I'd never felt this before, I didn't grow up this way, but it was very evident. Um, not only were my leaders making me feel second class, so was the institution. I was barred from one third of the jobs. So I had a chip on my shoulder. I get back from Iraq and uh, something that I really wanted to be a part of, being in the military, serving my country, avenging the attacks on September 11th. Um, timing worked out in 2011, the U.S. Army Special Operations Command had announced a new pilot program called the Cultural Support Teams. The purpose of the Cultural Support Teams were to specially assess and select a small group of women to deploy to Afghanistan with our Special Operations Units, Navy SEALs, Special Forces, and the 75th Ranger Regiment. So I took that chip on my shoulder, had something to prove, 
this program and deploying to Afghanistan was it. I made the cut, I did a train up, and in fall of September, um, excuse me, in fall of uh, 2011, in August, I deployed to Afghanistan as one of the first women to embed um, with the 75th Ranger Regiment, which they are the premier raid force for the US Army. My job was to go on night raids with the Rangers as the only woman with them and tactically question and search the women and children on target. Our mission was to find high value Al-Qaeda and Taliban targets. And because of cultural norms, our male counterparts were not allowed to question the women. So they had me to do that job. Now, my experience in Afghanistan was very much twofold. Myopically looking at me, I felt like what I was doing, me and the 15 other women that were part of my group, that we were stationed all around the country at different, uh, with different rangers or Navy SEALs, we, we were there to prove that women could be in direct combat roles. We weren't a liability. We were Americans wanting to serve our country, just like the men we were beside. That was very much my mission in Afghanistan. Well, mission number two <laughs> was also our larger strategy of counterinsurgency, find the bad guys, protect the homeland. And those two did not match at all. And it was very conflicting for me because I knew every single night when I'm going out on mission and I, f I got the critical piece of information or maybe I found a critical piece of intelligence, I was building rapport and credibility and respect with these men who were very, very skeptical about women being with them. This was not easy. This was very much a challenge for us. But on the other side, I knew that our tactics, as a 25-year-old who had not been to policy school yet <laughs> here at Kennedy School, knew that this wasn't making sense. Every night, what we are doing is scarring a child for life. They are going to forever remember the night the Americans kicked in their doors. Some people were killed, and it was violent and I was a part of it. And I knew we were creating more of an insurgency than what we were trying to thwart. So there comes the moral injury. Um, and I, yeah, on my deployment, one of, uh, one of my colleagues, she was killed in Kandahar, triple amputee. Two years later, two more of my girlfriends were killed in Afghanistan. And bringing this to today, it's hard to make sense of the loss. It's hard not to feel guilty that uh, my female colleagues and I, hey, we answered the call. We did. In 2016, the women in combat ban was rescinded. Women, man, if you meet certain standards, you can go into combat jobs. Um, and our success in the CSTs very much had a part in that, and I'm proud of that but a lot of my time in Afghanistan, I'm not, not proud of. Um, that's not to say that there were many, many good efforts going on. Um, Joe with his um, NGOs for women's education, there were a lot of great civil affairs teams building roads, infrastructure, schools. Um, that wasn't my experience though. So um, that's the moral injury part. And what's happened in this last month, it opens that wound and I've always thought I want to go back to Afghanistan and do a little good <laughs> um, to make up for my time there. And the way we have left in this debacle and what has happened hurts so bad. Nope. We're good? Oh, oh there you go. Great. Um, thank you, Shalane. Um, so my name is Soren Duggan, uh, and I think I have um, a kind of a different facet to add to the conversation. Um, I think we can all, all five of us can sit here for this entire hour and talk about our experiences and um, give us our lessons learned. And I would be surprised if they didn't overlap a lot in our final opinions about the war and about our, our observations about Afghanistan broadly. Um, but I think that I can add some interesting facets about the Taliban itself, the Al Qaeda uh, members and teams that we went there initially to fight was our initial mission. Um, from my experiences over there, I went 
for all of 2012, uh, stationed with the Defense Intelligence Agency and conducted interrogations out there of uh, high value targets of Taliban and Al Qaeda guys in uh, Northeast Afghanistan. Um, conducted a few hundred of them, spent a few thousand hours uh, speaking to uh, guys who, a, a few of which I have now seen on television uh, over the last few weeks, which is an alarming, uh, alarming thing to, uh, to see. Um, I'm not sure they know my real name, so maybe they, they might now, but um, I was, uh, I'm also a New Yorker. Um, I was lucky enough to be across the river in New Jersey on 9-11. I was 11 years old, uh, and that, that, that day really stuck with me. Um, come from a family, um, my stepfather's side, a lot of NYPD officers, and one of the uh, coveted retirement positions from the NYPD is to be a security officer in the World Trade Center. It's a nice work in air conditioning all day, um, and a lot of them uh, perished that day. It was a big, um, big loss for a lot of members of my family, and that, that day stuck with me, and it's the reason I joined uh, when I was 19. Um, spent a few years training uh, in intelligence collection, deployed in 2012. Um, in about two weeks of, of speaking with a few uh, Taliban guys over there, um, uh, they start you out small, you don't really get any cases that really mean anything for a bit, but uh, just speaking to those guys, I realized very quickly how this war was going to end, even in, t even in 2012. Um, I knew it in 2012, I knew it a year ago, I know it today. This, I've never been so viscerally shocked by something that I have known was gonna happen for nine years. Um, and that's been a very confusing conversation to have with myself and with others. Um, we're, the, we're the fifth empire to fail and to take Afghanistan, the fifth uh, world power. The first one was Alexander the Great about 2,300 years ago, and he is a... Uh, on record saying that Afghanistan is a easy place to march into and a tough place to march out of. And if that isn't applicable to our current issue, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what is. Uh, and that man didn't have a lot of problems uh, marching in and out of anywhere up until Afghanistan. Now he had just conquered the Persian empire and had marched east. Uh, I spoke to Taliban men who had fought the Russians and lived through that war, lived for 30 years in a war-torn state that didn't have much uh, there for it, and had, were fighting us. And they sat, in that, uh, they sat in, that, in that room with me. I spoke to them about their plans, um, what they thought of the United States, what they thought of me, what they thought of Russia. Uh, and that war wasn't something that they fought in their own life, on their own timeline. They had children that would continue to fight it. This was not something, we, we thought of this war in, in, in chunks of commanders, right? Um, whether it was Petraeus, McChrystal, um, COCOM commanders, they were chunks of time where men commanded that war. And that's the way that um, three presidents thought of that. They thought of this as a generational timeline. And if we had thought going into there that we could outlast that or somehow defeat them where four other empires thought that they could, uh, that was, that was a, uh, one of the biggest mistakes in, in strategy, military strategy that, I'm, that I think that we've ever made. Um, and I'm not, I, you know, obviously I was uh, young in the military. I wasn't in any sort of, you know, Pentagon planning rooms at that point. Um, but I really wonder why, or what we thought that we could do, what we thought that we could accomplish with that. And saying that, I think it's important to highlight, um, especially for you know, uh, the soldiers and airmen that are here, and especially for the ones that uh, are no longer here, there were two objectives in that country when we went in. It wasn't just one, it wasn't a nation building exercise. The first objective was to go in and find Al Qaeda teams, destroy them and weaken that organization that had caused 9-11. And I think that it is really important, if I have anything to say up here, to reinforce the fact that that mission itself was a wild success. Um, there, was, there have been many problems in how we executed that war. We can have those tough conversations now. It's good to look back and find those lessons learned. But it's, it's very important to remember, especially for the soldiers that didn't come back from that country, that that mission at the time had a mandate from our population and, in my personal opinion, was pulled off successfully. Um, the second mission that we had, I think we all know, didn't end well, um, and that country reverted to what it was when we first got there. It is an impossibly complex nation. Uh, they don't view the borders. Those borders were drawn um, 102 years ago, I suppose, by the British and the French in the Sykes-Picot. They don't acknowledge those borders. Afghanistan isn't a thing. It's Pashtunistan, and even that is a more nebulous idea. Uh, it's not a province, it's not district to district. In many cases in that country, it's not even tribe to tribe, it's valley to valley. And some people haven't even crossed the valley into the other one to speak to them in generations. And so to think that we could go in there 
and build a force that would be willing to die for something called Afghanistan, or a government that would be willing to govern something that we call Afghanistan, I think was incredibly foolish. And I hope that the lessons that we learned from that mistake are brought forward um, if and when uh, this happens again, whether it's in two weeks or 20 years, uh, that we can come together, not just in the Pentagon, but in institutions like this and um, really learn those lessons. So again, I, could, I, I think we could all speak for an hour here, so I'll cut it off, but thank you for having us. So I'm glad we started this conversation on 9-11 because that event shocked American consciousness and what we saw uh, this last month shocked American consciousness. And what we're doing right now is having a subjective conversation about all of our, all of our times there, which were limited, and it, this is very subjective. I can only tell you about what it was like for First Lieutenant Thomas Bishop, a platoon leader for a route clearance platoon that was supposed to find and clear IEDs in Afghanistan. And your first month there, you're not that good at it. There are a lot of people who did a lot more and, and left a lot more in that country. Um, there are humanitarian workers, volunteers, diplomats that also helped shape what we were doing there. And I think that matters and I'm humbled that we were asked to come here and talk because we're just telling our little part of this story. But that's the important part of what happened is that we, we stopped talking because about less than 3 million, 2.7 million people deployed during the, the wars uh, in Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, we're still in Kuwait, we're still doing these things. But there were about 6 million deployments that happened, which meant reservists who were told, we'll only send you when it's necessary and we're gonna make sure that we limit that. Well, that wasn't true. And when you send these people, when we talk about that 2.7 million, that's less than 1%. That's not the real number because their families went with them, their, their kids without mothers for a year, and then two years later, they went again. And we, we owe them something. You know, we owe them this conversation we owe making sure that they're mentally okay, that they're physically okay, that they have housing and, and jobs and employments because they lose them. It's hard for jobs to see you leave, not fill, it, fill the job or fill it, and, and have to have somebody leave that job who they trained up when you come back. That's the conversation that we have to have when we send Americans to war. I was a lieutenant. I cannot tell you about policy. I cannot tell you about what the right thing or the wrong thing to do. What happened this last month was we were able to do something that we've never seen before. But that now comes with a responsibility. When you, when you bring tens of thousands of people to a place, you have to make sure that they're okay. Afghanistan is not what you think it is. It's not a place with infrastructure, with you know, police officers that you can call up. Like That's not what that is. So when we talk about the shock that, that we saw when people, when it didn't go well, we shouldn't have been shocked, but we didn't know what it was because we stopped talking. We never did. You know, I, we meet each other and we'll talk for four hours at a bar and we know each other's stories, but the rest of the, the American consciousness doesn't until something like this happens. And so I think for me, my story is subjective. I can tell you about bombs all the time and trying to do different things, but it really is the fact that nobody cared until a few weeks ago what that story was. 
uh, for that. Just, um, I want to do a short follow-up, but before I do, if you want to ask a question, there are microphones over here, here. I think there's two up in the balconies there. If you want to step to the microphone, we're happy to take your questions. Um, just two things that, that I heard in your reflections. One is the internal conflict that you had, many of you, regarding whether it was the leadership, Shalane, that you talked about that you had to sort of kind of deal with that didn't deal with your situation with assault and harassment, but yet you stayed in it and you kept working at it. Uh, whether, you know, Bishop, it, it occurs to me that you, you mentioned what happens when people come home and the families uh, and, and how the United States has a responsibility there. Um, and the work, you know, that you're doing, Joe and Soren, what you've seen, and, and Eddie, I know um, you had mentioned to me you got injured, but yet you all stayed in the military. You believed in what you were doing individually. You believed in the collective and in one another. Um, and that's a general recurring theme that I heard. So with that being said, I wonder if um, I want to shift to um, the takeaways from these experiences um, that you've had in Afghanistan, in these wars, in this particular war, if you were to articulate a lessons learned or takeaway with the complexities that you all face, what do people need to know? Anyone can jump in, Eddie, if you want to. Yeah, I'll start. Um, first, uh, I just want to say, uh, and I get to say soldiers because we're all soldiers here in this panel, but we're not politicians. Um, we are an instrument of, of war. We're an instrument of foreign policy. And no man or woman who has never set foot on a battlefield can truly understand what it takes to be on it. Once the fight starts, there's only winning or losing or living and dying. And, uh, and on April 14th, 2011, I learned that lesson the hard way. Um, the, the takeaway that I want to reflect on is uh, tomorrow is not promised. Um, when an RPG uh, detonated uh, next to me, um, that day was one of the most complex attacks that we have seen during my rotation. Um, more than five vehicle-borne IDs were involved in trying to overrun our combat out outpost. Uh, multiple dismounted uh, enemy with suicide vests, RPG gunners, um, and the enemy really tried to uh, penetrate our combat outpost with a vehicle-borne ID, and then the dismounted enemy would come in and run towards uh, soldiers and try to detonate. But um, once I got injured uh, and I laid there and I realized how foolish it was to think that death cared about my life plans. Um, as I laid there, I learned that dying wasn't scary. It was just sad. I was supposed to have more time. That's what I kept thinking to myself. I felt overwhelming regret knowing that I wasn't going to be able to be that husband, that father that I've always wanted to be. I remember the night before talking to my wife and trying to talk to my three-year-old son and anybody that has a little boy at three knows he has no attention span. And me being frustrated because he wouldn't stay on the phone and talk with daddy. Um, luckily for me, I was given a second chance. Um, and not everybody gets a second chance. Some of our brothers and sisters didn't make it back, but I say to you, take that chance. If you ever have doubts on doing a specific thing, don't wait till tomorrow, do it today. Go home, hug that person, a significant other, other, hug your husband, wife, significant other, your kids, tell them you love them, 
because tomorrow is not promised. And that is definitely a lesson learned that, that I live today. I try to live my, my life in honor of, of my battle buddies that didn't make it back. Um, war has a human domain factor that a lot of people don't understand, right? When we go to war, um, we're not really thinking about, you know, those strategic strategies, those uh, strategic objectives that we have to achieve. We're thinking about our buddies who are left and our right. Um, I, Eddie, thank you for sharing that intimate portrait. When you were talking, when you watch the news at night, you see these numbers of casualties and people wounded and their numbers, but there are people behind those numbers. There are human beings behind those numbers, injuries. And, you know, as you spoke, I think we all need to understand that and realize that these aren't just data points. Um, please, does anyone want to step in and share lessons learned from your perspective? It'll help clear my throat. <laughs> <clears throat> so one of, going back to kind of the story I shared, where there's that dichotomy of um, my mission, I am, I am doing something that's advancing the cause of like service women but it is coming at a cost of something, of um, poor strategy, ruining lives, <coughs> people losing their lives. One of my lessons learned, or like large reflections that I have, um, is how does that apply to our senior leaders and where do we need to check some greed or selfishness in the name of professional advancement, in the name of it's your time to be the commander and to lead, and, and the amount of courage that it takes for people to recognize um, when to say, hey, the path we're on is not working. Um, we don't need more troops here. Perhaps we need to have a smart withdrawal. Um, perhaps we need to um, rethink our strategy and course. I, I think even at the junior soldier level, there's something exciting about deploying. There's something that's a little selfish about the adventure and the thrill of choosing the profession of arms. And I have to believe that the, uh, the folks wearing stars on their chest feel the same way. They have been in uniform for 30 years, waiting for their time to be the commander of this and that. And, um, and I think when that goes unchecked by civilian oversight, civilian leaders, the constituents, citizens of our country, we get a war that goes on for two decades. Um, so I think... Uh, Big lesson learned is we need to check ourselves and our country was founded on checks and balances for a reason and I think they were lots of times absent in this conversation on Afghanistan. Uh, Joe, did you? Yeah, I want to piggyback on Shalane's really entire story. So thanks, thanks for that, Shalane. Um, women in leadership positions in the United States military and, and, and in geopolitics in general. Part of the problem with these strategies is that they are propagated by these old boys clubs that just reinforce this sense of arrogance and this lack of, of just critical, I don't wanna say critical thinking, but criticism. And so we need more women in positions of leadership in the Air, um, in the Air Force and in all of the Army uh, and all of the military. And then in, uh, and then geopolitics as well. Um, just quickly, my, my main thing, my main takeaway from Afghanistan is just how important of a role that women play in societies like Afghanistan and how much, how critical, how their empowerment is critical to the stability of those communities. Um, it's not something that I had thought about before deploying. I was a 28-year-old fighter pilot um, 
who only cared about flying airplanes. And over the last 10 years working with NGOs and nonprofits and with hundreds of Afghan women, it, it, it's apparent to me that there is a direct connection between women's equality and empowerment and their ability to hold leadership positions in their community and that community's success. So I think that's my main takeaway. Thank you very much, sir. Did you have a question? Hello. Okay, awesome. Um, thank you all so much for joining us tonight um, in, a, in a very thoughtful conversation. My name is Stephanie Lin. I am a sophomore here at the college and one of the student members of the JFK committee here at the IOP. Um, the war in Afghanistan has left an unforgettable impact in the communities abroad and here at home. Um, and I wanted to ask, you know, from your perspective, um, what is your vision for America's armed forces um, and military activity going forwards in the future? And I think as expressed um, across the board and all of the sentiments tonight, war has a very, very heavy cost. Um, and so I want to ask, what do you wish to see in our approach towards conflict um, and resolution going forwards? The words you said were, were unforgettable impact. That's, that's what I hope this is, is we remember what happened so that now and in the future, we, we think about training and equipping today, making sure that people are okay today. And then when they deploy, we think, we don't forget about how they're living and what the war actually looks like when they're there and making sure that we check on those families and that they have a community, a, an entire American community when they deploy again. And when they get back, we take care of them and their families. I hope that is the legacy and what we do with the people that we've we've brought to this country, that can be a legacy too. Our story isn't over. Um, I hope people get that this isn't over yet. You know, we can talk about winning and losing, but what we do with people matters. And if we can do it for them, if we can ship people from Afghanistan to America, what can we do for the lowest here that we have here now? It's not a, it's not a, a or or a but, it's an and. We, we can do both. So I, I hope that's what the legacy is. I think, um, you know, it, there's people have said in government, especially leaders, you know, um, that at the federal level have said that in these, in these war planning rooms, some of the biggest doves in the rooms are the ones that had gone and seen conflict. And I think that that's pretty apparent. Um, we've had a lot of conflict been driven by civilians um, and bureaucrats who have not joined the military and not seen that conflict. The civilian military divided in the Department of Defense is real. There's a big history of that. I, I, I do believe in that. Um, but I also think it's important to take men and women who have seen combat, um, like all five of us have, um, and seen violence and seen what conflict is. The, the loss is not just soldier to shoulder, soldier to soldier or fighter to fighter. There's, there's second and third order effects of, of, of war that are um, much, much more difficult uh, for me to think about. I lived, I, I went to Syria in, in 2017. I lived next to uh, the third largest city in Syria at that point, which was a UNESCO refugee camp on the Jordanian border. It's about 120,000 refugees there. Um, and the things I saw in that refugee uh, camp and coming out of, the, out of that refugee camp are far worse than the, uh, than the things I saw in combat or violence. Um, it's important to note that. I guess my, my, my point being is that you have these amazing soldiers, airmen, marines, um, sailors that have, that have gone to war, seen combat, engaged in, in foreign policy in that, in that realm that are coming back now that can, I think can give a lot of lessons learned to policymakers. Um, the military, we spend a lot of money on the military. I do think that it can be a force for peace. Um, there is peace through diplomacy, but force backs diplomacy. Um, Ike Eisenhower became president and that's how he governed as, as president was diplomacy backed by force, I think that there, is, that there is an option there to use that. But I hope that moving forward, um, especially after Afghanistan and after Iraq, that we use our military more as a, 
as a force to keep peace uh, and to prevent conflict and having seen conflict, all five of us, I think given the opportunity and given the choice, we would do anything that we can to prevent a conflict in the future knowing firsthand uh, what it is like. Thank you. We'll go over here. All right. Uh, Thank you all for being here and for your service. Uh, Colonel, this is a question for you. Um, uh, thanks so much for your service and being vulnerable uh, to sharing your personal story. Uh, that really is what true strength is about. Um, if a young American came up to you um, when you're in uniform, knowing what you know now about what happened in Afghanistan and coming towards the end of it, um, and said, you know, what, what do you do? Uh, how would you answer that question? Do you tell a story? Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. For, that's a great question. And, uh, and I do tell a story, and I tell my story. I'm a kid from Puerto Rico that his first language was Spanish. My father, my great-grandfather, um, all served in the military, all have high school education. And we lived in this, I call it a vicious cycle, right? They were all, they were all poor, um, not educated. They couldn't break that cycle. What the Army gave me, gave me opportunities, right? I'm here at Harvard today because of the, the, the Army. The Army paid all my education. Uh, two masters sent me to learn a third uh, language. I got to, uh, um, I've been uh, stationed in four U.S. embassies, been a pull mill advisor to ambassadors and to generals. So, yes, the Army's not perfect, but it gives you opportunities. It gives you opportunities to serve your country. Um, and that responsibility is, you can't get that anywhere else. That, the lesson to lead America gives us their national treasures, their sons and daughters, and puts them under our responsibility. What greater responsibility is that? So if any young American wants to serve, I will say 100% serve your country. And uh, what, what an awesome opportunity to, to serve this country and, and wear the nation's cloth. So yeah, anytime. Is this on? All right. Good evening. Uh, thank you all for coming. We really appreciate it. My name is Luis Estevasuero. I'm a sophomore here at the college. And one recurring theme that uh, Lieutenant Colonel Figueroa and uh, Mr. Bishop, you both emphasized, but all of you touched on, is this idea that there is a disconnect between the American public and a true understanding of the experiences and the situations on the ground where the American military goes. And my question for all of you is, what is the way that we can start bridging this gap? Is it the responsibility of the public, of the civilians, to seek out these stories and truly engage them? Is it the responsibility of the media to portray a more candid portrayal of uh, America abroad? How do you guys see us resolving this issue that has led to so many misunderstandings throughout our nation's history? So I have a few ideas. Um, I think it's easy to use the media as, as the boogeyman sometimes, but when you think about what we've become today, you know, when was the last time you saw a lot of military people in a parade? You know, their, their junior ROTC programs are getting fewer and fewer between. Uh, a lot more colleges don't have ROTC programs on campus and even service members are told if you can change before you before you leave the base and make sure you know for for national security implications as well but you don't see them in the airport and all of these other places so we're disappearing you don't know that you're supposed to ask you don't know that we're supposed to talk you know, we don't even know how our military is made up. A lot of people don't know that people who are not yet citizens can be a part of our military and they're serving and they're doing good works. So 
you know, at the individual level, you have to ask, you have to, you have to find those things, but in our institutions as well, we have to make a choice on what we're going to embrace, and you have to embrace those things. We're, we're not just in instruments of destruction. We are implements of American foreign policy. We are you. So if we aren't of you, that's a problem. And that's, that's been part of what we've seen is we aren't of each other. And we've kind of pushed away from the military in a lot of different instances. And it's been personal, institutional, and it's got to change if we want to make sure that it doesn't look that way in the future. Go, go ahead, please. Thank you so much for sharing your stories tonight, especially Shalene, I wanted to thank you for your story, it really resonated with me. Um, I wanted to touch on the role of private contractors because one thing that we talked about earlier was how all of you were nodding your heads when you were saying you could have seen this end of the war coming for the past nine years. A lot of military people have been saying that in the past month. And we talked a little about the hyper-masculine culture of senior government and military officials that are kind of prolonging this war. Um, what role do private military contractors have in that and what was your experience with them on the ground? Thank you. So, so I flew the F-35, um, which is uh, built by Lockheed Martin and potentially one of the, you know, I won't say too much, but one of the most um, glaring examples of how the military industrial complex has potentially gotten out of control. Um, do, does, is there a machine behind the scenes potentially propagating that? I mean, I can't say one way or the other, I would assume so. But what I can say is that, you know, there do need to be checks and balances in place on the military industrial complex specifically when it comes to weapons acquisitions and creation, you know, to make sure that there's a levels of accountability there so that you don't end up with, uh, I mean, I can say it now that I'm out, an F-35 that has a trillion dollar program that could go into social programs that we need, um, but it's just not a, great, uh, not a great machine, but was able to be made because it's built in all 50 states or at least 46 of them and just no one asks any questions. So I, I feel that, I feel it. Want to answer that question? Or? Uh, I mean, if I can play devil's advocate just a little bit, and I don't want to, but we we also have to remember that when we went to war, you know, in World War One and World War Two, the military did everything. So the people who brought the food, who brought the the petroleum, all of these things where you needed. Uh, multiple million person military, a lot of those things are done by contractors and third party nationals because we don't fight that way anymore. If you don't want that to exist, it means we all go to war. And I'm not saying that's a good or bad thing, but that's what, that, that's what happens in most countries when they have to go to wars, everybody goes. Everybody loses something, everybody sacrifices. And now we're able to do that so that the public doesn't feel it as much. I, do. I, know, I know we're a minute over time, but I, I think it's in that same vein. So when I got out, um, I got out of the military at the end of 2018. I did a year of private contracting before I, I, I went to school and um, it was all domestic stuff, but it was a, it was a position um, that kind of required some really specific expertise and a few credentials that take a long time to get in the military. You don't really receive outside of the military. Um, they're difficult credentials to get. They take a lot of time. They're long courses. Um, and those positions, the, the position that I filled, would have had to have been filled by a soldier and taken out of the fight to put, in, to put um, you know, domestically to organize these missions, trying to speak around a bit. But, um, you know... That's a, that's a scenario in which private contracting, I think, is useful, right? Because you can take somebody out that doesn't want to go back into combat or is getting out of the military and wants to have a few years of a buffer or whatever it may be, and it's a really nice way to, to do that. I think that it's important to separate what happened during the, the Bush years and the war crimes that were committed by, by private contractors in Iraq. That, I, it's important to note that that, that time really is over. We, I, it is unfortunate that it happened. I, you know, I don't think enough justice has come out of that personally, um, but that, those are some, some bloody lessons that we learned that I think the, 
the realm is a little different now than it, than it used to be. I do think, in, in your point, it is wildly overbloated, and we are spending way too much money on it. I don't think anybody will argue with that. That does need to be reined in um, wholeheartedly. So. Well, we could go on for another hour or two, um, but we can't, unfortunately. Um, before I wrap up, I want to thank um, the Center for Public Leadership here um, and the Black Family Fellows, as well as National Security Fellows from Belfer. Uh, we co-partnered on this event uh, with the speakers and the panel, so I want to thank both of those centers. I also want to thank um, Andrew Webster. I think that's you back there. I got you on the, with the mask. I've only seen you on the screen. Uh, chair of the Armed Forces Committee at the Harvard Kennedy School. And I want to thank our dean who um, really supported this event and wanted this event to happen uh, school-wide. Um, this has been a remarkable discussion. And to conclude, um, I was thinking about the comment or question that was made by one of the questioners, which is whose responsibility is it to make sure we share military experiences, service members' experience on the ground with civilian and public policymakers. One is you have these remarkable, remarkable people here in your midst here at the Kennedy School. You should take advantage of them being in your midst every single day. There's a real opportunity for you all to do that. The second thing I would say is um, you heard some pretty difficult, painful comments and stories, as well as um, some realities and experiences from the five panelists here that you should build on and think about and reflect upon. There was a lot that was said here. Um, so I want to uh, really give a great word of thanks for the five people on this panel for their service to this country through all that they've been through um, and for participating and sharing tonight. This was a real terrific panel. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you.